Hello, it's Kasim Reed in the apartments with Pale. Hey, Pale. Meet me at the apartment. <laughs> Yo, we back. It's your boy Pale. And we're in the apartment with Pale. Meet me in the apartments. Every time y'all hear me come on the show, y'all always hear me say, I love my city. I love my city to death. I, I, you know, everybody got to see these things that you don't like about it, these things that you love about it. Sometimes the good outweigh the bad, sometimes the bad outweigh the good. But when you're really from Atlanta and you've seen where, where it came from and how it was built and the people that, was, that had something to do with it, you have a different love and a different sense of the city. I was born in the 80s, so I seen the 90s. I seen the 2000s. I was a big part of building the 2000s. And I don't seen these past 10 years. And I don't seen what the city was and what it is now. So when people say the old Atlanta, I understand what people mean when they say the old Atlanta. And throughout this whole experience, my next guest has been one of the people that has made it possible for a lot of things to happen in the city, for us to get a lot of revenue, for a lot of people to get in position. When, when you talk about people of this magnitude in the city, he is one of the people that are responsible for bringing people together. Everybody who I know know him always said that he has something that can't be taught. He's a people person. He's the person that can bring two different parties together, and he's just magic. And the times I've been seeing around him, his charisma, the way he talked, the way he interacted with people, it's like you'll sit back and you'll be astonished by it. You know what I'm saying? And when you're from the streets and you don't been around great people, you see this. And where I come from, I'm used to seeing this in dope boys and the, 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 the big homies and the OGs who lead the hood. When you think about people who run the city and politicians and, um, and, and people like that, you like to think, you don't think of they come at, come at you with a, a firm thing and I don't know how to explain it. It's just when you meet somebody and they got that, you just know it. And um, I just want to welcome. I'm going to go on this. I'm going to go ahead and say this. I'm going to jump on them and say this. I'd like to welcome next Atlanta mayor to the <laughs> Apollo Palais. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is that a clothing Yes. Yeah, um, you got Stack Master? Oh, uh, yeah. Stack for later. It's um, every cl all the clothes I wear on my show, black on. Okay. I don't wear no clothes that's not black on. Yeah. Um, Tell me about that line. Um, this is one of my little homies' lines, Stat for Lady. He's been doing it for about two, about two years now. Okay. He do it himself. Um, he get his clothes made. And the reason I like his brand is because he really take the time out to, for the detailing on his brand. Yeah. And, no, you know, I'm usually sure. people get the T-shirts, and they get the T-shirt machine. They just press it on there. Yeah, no, and it, like, I like this. Yeah, and I like it. Yeah, it's embroidered, stitched, stitched up. You know what I'm saying? Good material, good feeling. Stack for later, everybody. I'm looking at it. I'm going to get me some when I get out of here. Oh, no, definitely. I'm definitely yeah, going to hook you up with it. Piece. No, definitely going to hook yeah. you up with it. Um, the thing that you have done for this city. Yes. And not just the things, the way that you have done these things. Yes. It's astonishing. I'm from Atlanta. I was born at Grady. Yeah. Graduated at Doug. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I understand the vision and how the city look from my side. Yeah. And the reason I say my side is because I was raised and born home. And the things I seen around me, the people I seen around me, everything I do and everything that I say and everything I speak is for my people. Yeah. It's for the people of the struggle who don't understand these type of things. The only thing they know is the things that they know. Yeah. I want to be the person who brings stuff to them and enlighten them on different things so they can get the knowledge and be knowledgeable of the things that's going to help them. No, that's what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? I came here because you're respected. Mm -hmm. And when I got the call, first of all, you had Chris Hicks on, who's like my brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, he called me and said, man, you got to you gotta sit down with Parlay. Mm -hmm. And I immediately said, let's, let's make it happen because you are respected. And then I got to be somewhere and come on a show where I could be here in 10 minutes. Because yeah. I live off Campbellton Road, off N in Nisky Lake, Cascade area. So it was great to be in a part of the city where I didn't have to, <laughs> I didn't have to yeah. drive to Buckhead through traffic. I could shoot up Campbellton Road. So it was, I mean, when, when I found out, I was like, he's really living it, you know? Oh, yeah, man, you know, uh, from people right that I know too. from Tyler Perry Studios. Definitely. I know this is like, a, you got a lot of friends from this area. Yeah. This area is a big area, is a pivot area for me too, because I recorded our first album with the Franchise Board 
right down the street at Rocco Studio yeah. also. Yeah, and you working with Phaedra Parks when Fats. y'all did them Phaedra <laughs> yep. the Franchise Boys. Definitely, definitely. I was real close to that. So let's start it back from Plainville. You were born in Plainville, New Jersey. Yep. Uh, came to Atlanta. Yeah, when I was like three months old. Yeah, when you, when you was young. Okay. You went to West, or you went to? Westwood. West, 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 West Lake West. High, which is, which used to be Westwood High That's School. That's right, which used to be, so Lakeshore and Westwood merged, mm-hmm. which used to be Lakeshore High School. It merged with Westwood, and then it made West Lake. And I got, I had the honor of going back to my old school and giving the commencement speech there a few years ago. But yeah. No, so I grew up you know, off Cascade Road in Niski Lake, and I went to West Lake, and then I went to Howard University for undergrad and law school, and then I came right back home. Okay, let's talk about this then, because I, I know you being at Howard was a big thing, because I know a few people that went to Howard, and yeah. everybody speak of, they say, K, K, yeah. and I just yeah. talk to people, and they say, K, and I, 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 I just talk to them, yeah. and I never really understood <laughs> it until I started hearing other people say, K, I said, that's the scene. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> I know that when I had Chris on here also on the podcast, yeah. Chris talked about you being the one to introduce him to the music business. I did. Him and first Ryan. Came. Yes. They moved to Atlanta, and I got them their first office building. So when Noontime was founded off Walker Street, where a lot of hit records were made with J-Dub and Dent and the Hitmen, um, I mean, I brought them here. We met in Washington, D.C. We did our first, their first show we all did together, which is, so when you watch the Biggie Small movie mm-hmm. on the life of Biggie Smalls and they're doing the Howard University show, that was our show. Yeah, Mary J. Blige, Mary Rex J. And Blige, Effects. Big, Rex Big, and Effect. Yeah, it was just, yeah. what a night. How, okay, I'm going ask you this. Yeah. At this time and then, when all these people are the ones emerging in our culture, how was it, that you was able to get all these groups at this time to come to Howard and perform? Because Puff and I were friends. And so if you look at my class, so D-Dot was in my class at Howard. Mark Pitts was at Howard. Puff was at Howard. So that whole part of the culture, Ward Corbett from Mount Vernon, New York. Then I met Chris and Ryan. So they had that West Coast feel to them. Um, Oakland and all of the rest, that whole vibe. And then we all recognized and felt like we were all going to be highly successful. And so we were black men who could see other black men who we felt were, were number ones, meaning were special guys. And so we started working together. And so Puff, of course, got Mary and Big for us. Um, Chris got Rex in effect. And we just leveraged our relationships, and we made a lot of money that night. We sold out two shows, and, um, and then we graduated. I went to law school, and then Ryan and Chris moved here. Uh, and then there was another brother who I miss every day named Shakir Stewart, who was all of our little brother. Then I was Shakir's lawyer as his uh, career moved, and he became uh, an executive. Uh, but more than that, he was like a little brother to all of us, and he ends up becoming the president of Def Jam. And then another uh, strange factor not a, not a lot of folks know is Bernard Parks and I have known each other since first grade. Shout so to pa- Bernard, Bernard. Bernard manages Goody Mob mm-hmm. through four albums. So that took me into the Dungeon family with Rico, Organized Noise, and that whole relationship. So I was Backbone's lawyer when he did Five Deuce for Trey, the album that he did with Universal. Um, when Big Gip did his solo record, I did Big Gip's solo record. And what I used to do, I used to do music publishing deals. And back in the day, that's where you got your real, real check. Mm-hmm. That was when we made real money in music. And so Phaedra Parks and I were coming up at the same time. So Phaedra and I were close. And Atlanta was just the center of action. And now Atlanta runs the music world. Thanks. But the foundation for all of that um, was us running up and down Campbellton Road and Camp Creek Parkway and downtown and Cascade Road and all of that. So we're getting ready to do some exciting things. Of course, we knew uh, Jermaine, who was down Old National Highway. Mm -hmm. So it was this really unusual energy and divine. So if you look at the mix, um, all of us were coming along at the same time. Um, Rosanda, Chile, she lived on 1975 Rogers Avenue. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. right off in southwest Atlanta, right by uh, John A. White Park. Zonda and I are friends when we were growing up, still friends to this day. And so that was just an amazing amount of talent to come out of the city of Atlanta. And so that's why it was so easy for us to transition into being uh, the number one motion picture and television site uh, in America and then in the world. We, for five years, we were number one. And I think five out of the ten biggest motion pictures were made in Atlanta while I was mayor. So all three Avengers movies were made while I was mayor. Fast movie was made while I was mayor. And then, of course, Black Panther. When you're watching Black Panther, the final scene where he's giving that speech, that's City Hall. Mm. So it was shot throughout City Hall, and I, I gave the building to them to use. Um, and now they're actually filming Black Panther 2 um, right down the street, right at Tyler Perry Studios. And, of course, I did the deal with Tyler Perry to sell Fort McPherson to him to create um, the biggest uh, motion picture studio owned by a black man in the world. It, like, stuff like that, it's not, it's not a lot of people, especially in back city, black cities, who take these black people from their city and help them to excel and to do everything that they can in their power to help them. You know what I'm saying? And another example why I'm saying that, while we're talking about just helping people, I know an example they told me that time that um, you helped Pinky out. Yeah, from trying Vegan. to shut it down. Yeah. So right down the street, Pinky Cole, who I think is one of the most phenomenal women I've ever met, she became so successful that the neighborhood wanted to close her. Because the lines were just so long, people were complaining about the lines, and then the business owner were, were complaining about the lines in front of their businesses. And so people started playing real hardball with her. They started calling um, Fulton County inspections on her, just doing what you do to black people to end them. And I showed up, and I said, nobody's going to end you. Your story is going to finish. You're incredible. And uh, one of the funniest things in the world was when she had to go to court, and uh, and I showed up as her lawyer. It was yeah. a very short, <laughs> it was a very short proceeding. Yes, and then <laughs> note for everybody watching, you did this, and you didn't even have a relationship with her. Really knew her like that. Yeah, well, you know, Shaka um, is behind the scenes everywhere, mm -hmm. and so Shaka and Pinky are close. And when Pinky really started taking off, she was smart enough to affiliate with Shaka Zulu, who's like a brother to me. And so when he has a problem, I have a problem. And so if somebody's got a problem with Shaka and Pinky, then they have a problem with me. And so we, we, we just did the right thing, and we negotiated an arrangement. Uh, she's still there today, and she's opening uh, locations faster than I can keep up with. But she is one of the, she's one of the great Atlanta stories, and I could just go on and on about the people who are special who we intervened on their behalf because that's what makes Atlanta unique in the world. There is no other city like the city of Atlanta on earth, which is why I'm running for mayor. Because everything we built is at risk right now because of the level of violence that we're seeing. I mean, this weekend we had three people murdered in one night. And we're at 103 murders right now. And you're from here, Parlay. We have a code. And the city is really out of code right now. Thanks. And it is driven by a lot of folks who are not from here who came here and they behave in a way that's inconsistent with who we are. Mm -hmm. And then we respond to that right? because we're not a people that tolerates discourtesy. Thanks. And so that has expanded and nobody has been managing this conversation managing the, the public safety framework. So you can be for safety and security and not be an Uncle Tom or a buck dancer. No, right? definitely. You know? And now, and I think that point that you said is one of the reasons I end up getting into, like you could say, the political stuff. Yes. Because, like I said, I'm from Bon Home, so I, I really don't believe in none of it. Yes. Because I don't see, I didn't never seen how it affected me yes. personally. Yes. So me not understanding that, I really never just cared about it. Until one of my good friends who's from Born Home too, named Mooley, used to always tell me, Pale, you too smart, but you're not like the rest of these people. You need to get in this. And I'd be like, Mooley, I ain't, I ain't for all that. So this kind of came up, and Mooley was like, Pale, I want to have a meeting with you, Erica Shields, before she resigned from the police. Absolutely. And then I want you to meet this guy named Chris, 
um, wise, he's running for DA. Christian. I think, I shout think, out to him. shout out to Christian. Yeah. I think that you can help. So I'm like, oh, I, am, I don't know nothing about that. So I call my big brother Trick Trick from Detroit, and he he does these things. And I and I asked him, he enlightened me, and he showed me what how that these things do do affect me. Yeah. And he showed me how the mayor um, coexists with the um, the police and the police foundation and the police union. He told me how the DA and the relationships work. He told me how to use these things, and I said, you know what? I can use my voice for that. So that's how I met Chris. I met Chris five days before his election. Yes. We sat down. I had to meet him. I said, I want to see who he is first okay. before I even put my name because I'm the type of person, when it comes to the streets, if I, if I stamp Parlay's name on it, people just going to say that's what it is. So I take that very like serious. A clean version of Blue Magic. F- facts. So. Exactly. <laughs> so I sat down with Chris, <laughs> and Chris was like, let's do it. I said, I vibe with you. I vibe with your story. So after two days of meeting, we set up a march on Bankhead. In 24 hours, we probably had two or 300 people march from Doug to Crucial. Um, Desi Banks came out, T.I. came out, a whole bunch of people came out, and they got a chance to talk to Chris. So after the thing, they said Chris wasn't going to get 5,000 votes. He ended up getting like 30,000 30, or something. Oh, he's amazing. And everybody was like, well, how you do that? And we were just like, man, we just relied on the people and just had a connection with the people. So then after that happened, we got with Paul, um, Paul Howard ran. Yeah. We stood with Paul, yeah. and everybody was like, well, Paul, hey, hey Paul, lock people, how you do it? I say, listen, y'all, because I understand. You need to be able to talk to them. You know what I'm saying? I understand, and and I'm using me as a person who done been in jail and done been the person that, that's been went, been to jail and been convicted and um, indicted from Paul Howard. So if me, a person that I relate to, could say, I'm going to put this to the side because us working together is going to better our people, then that's what needs to happen, and that's kind of what got me into doing this political stuff and using my voice to explain to people. So with all that being said, I want you to explain to people how the relationship works as far as the mayor, the DA, the police foundation, sure. the police, and how all that coexists to help. So I can go back and say, this how we help Kasim, this how Kasim helps us yeah. with the thing that's going on. So I'm happy to talk about that. On any given day, if you're the mayor of Atlanta, when you wake up, you're the first and second most powerful person in the state. The governor is the most powerful person in the state. But you're a number two, and then on some days you're number one. Um, the city is the part of government that's most close to the people that live in the city. Right? When, when, you get, when, you, when your trash doesn't get picked up, you don't, you don't call the president. When you go to pay your water bill, you don't call the governor. You go, you pay the city. Um, when you're moving and hit a pothole, you don't call the governor, you call the city. Um, your child is in the public school system for most of us. Some of us have children in private school, but that's the city. So where you sit, the aspect of life that is most important to you, they control how much you pay in property taxes mm-hmm. on your home. If you don't pay your property taxes on your home, they can take your home. That's the city. Mm-hmm. Whether the property taxes go up. That's the city. If you ask me, all of that is more close to you than many of the other layers of government that you feel. The other part is, is you know where your mayor works and you know where your mayor is and you can talk to him. One of the best parts of being mayor is anywhere you are, people feel like they own you, own a part piece of you. Not in a negative way, but from a standpoint of people come and tell me about their day, what they're going through what situations they have in a way that they don't, they wouldn't walk up to the governor and say that, I don't believe. And so I think that that's why being mayor is such a phenomenal job because every day you wake up, you're dealing with 15 to 16 issues of various kinds. You're working to build a stadium for the Atlanta Falcons, the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. You're doing a deal to renovate State Farm Arena. You're also cutting a ribbon on a park, and you met a woman whose water got turned off and she needs her water turned back on. All in the same day. Mm -hmm. Then you're driving home, you're with Parlay for 30 minutes, an hour. Then you get in the car, and you're at the St. Regis. You're giving a speech for a charitable event. Then you're moving south. You're over at Greenbrier, stopping by Piccadilly to speak to some seniors. 
And everywhere you go, you're the center of action when you show up. And everywhere where people are waiting for you, there is no substitute. There's nobody that could have came and sat here and do this show today that's the same as me. And so it's why it's a wonderful job if you're curious and energetic and if you love people like I love. I love people, and I really love black people. And I really, like, stay here. Mm -hmm. I, like, I, I, I'm really from here. Like, I get my hair cut at Rick's on Campbellton Road. I still I live in Guilford Forest. I've lived within three miles of where I live today my whole life. And we're blessed because... We're one of those rare black cities where a successful black person doesn't have to move next door to a white person mm -hmm. in order to have a very high quality of life. And so that's why I'm here and that's why this is so important and why this election is so important because the goose that laid the golden egg, and I refer to Atlanta that way, is sick. And if we don't get the crime and violence that is causing people to die, um, in ways that are extraordinary. Three people being shot on the weekend, a sister being abducted right near her house, woman goes running by Piedmont Park, has her insides removed, they cut off her dog's head. Guy's running in a park in Buckhead, he gets shot. I mean, there are things that are going on that are inconsistent with who we are as a city, and someone needs to push back forcefully on our behalf, and I think that that person is the mayor, and I think that you can do it and maintain your core, and you can do it in a post-525 George Floyd way. I mean, I'm the same guy that insisted that police officers have body cams. I'm the same guy who decriminalized marijuana possession. I'm the same guy that says if a police officer is involved in a shooting, then there's going to be a third party that investigates it. And I'm the same guy that disbanded Red Dog. But I also let me drop a bun. Hold on, hold on, Cindy. For let me drop, let me drop a bun for that. I'm gonna give some claps for that. Yeah, that was me. I'm gonna hit a horn for that. Yeah. Let me drop a bun for that. They were a little too in. Get some gunshots. For that. Oh man, I, I don't been a victim of the red dot before. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? They was, a, they were too intense with it. And so the point, the point I'm making is, is that you can do all of this. And when I walked out of the door, crime was the lowest it had been in 40 years. I hired 900 police officers. But really, Parlay, we just need some basic rules that I need you to share with people. Mm -hmm. Don't touch a woman. You can't put a gun in anybody's chest and take their car. You can't kill nobody. If you don't do those three things, Atlanta is the Atlanta that we know. That is not mm -hmm. a high demand. You can't touch a woman. You can't put a gun in nobody's chest and take their vehicle. And cannot kill nobody. If you do that, Atlanta will feel like the Atlanta we know, and we will be we will be operating by a code. And if you do that when I'm mayor, it's going to be really, really intense for you. And the streets are going to support me because I'm going to do so many other things to dictate to to demonstrate my heart. We're going to have an amnesty period for a hundred days. If you have any case in municipal court related to the city, when I become mayor, if I win in November, you're going to have 100 days to walk in and clear it up for free as long as it's not a DUI. So you'll get that warrant off your head. Whatever your situation is, I'm going to have Christian wives involved. We're just going to clean it up. But when you look at what that's going to do for people's lives who are moving with warrants in situations, mm -hmm. just they're just going to move in a different way. No, definitely. That helps yeah. my people. This yeah. this is something definitely that I can take to my people because one thing I understand is too is that the young people now are the future. Yes. And the young people now are are not like the young people when we were. They here. are not. And to be able to talk to these young guys and have them support, you have to be a certain type of person. You can't be a goody person trying to talk to a kid who put guns in people's chests. Mm -hmm. You have to be a person who I've done that before exactly. to be able to to be able talk to to, to be able to talk to that's him. That's why I'm talking to you. And I think that's why I want to take my voice and my platform to be that person that does that because I don't overcome a lot of stuff being here, mm -hmm. and I think that I have so I can be a testimony. Mm -hmm. 
And I done hooked up with people and to be sitting here with people like you to use these voices to be able to help people and show them how this directly helps them. Mm -hmm. So people get an amnesty program where people can get their wants off their head and get their life back. They don't have to move around and fearful. Now they, they can won't. go get them some money. They, they can get take more chances. They, they can get the drive the going. Drive. That's big. We're going to do that. Uh, and like the brothers who are selling water in intersections, they're not going to be allowed to do that. But I am going to give them a contract to sell, sell water to the city. Now you're big. not going to be able to be on intersections, but you're going to make more money with me because the city of Atlanta is a $2.2 billion organization. We have 9,000 employees, and we need lots and lots and lots of water. So if you can show up at an intersection, you can show up at a facility that we're going to name and identify, and you're going to make more money providing water to recreation centers, senior centers, senior facilities than you ever made on intersections. So I'm, you're not going to lose one penny with me. But the days of, uh, of being at people's vehicles at intersections, like that's going to come to a really calm close. Um, but I'm telling folks all of this in advance so that folks can decide whether they want to vote for me or not. Right, so I'm not going to spring anything on anybody. Mm -hmm. But my fundamental position is that there is no one who is asserting the rights of people who have been here the whole time or understand the Atlanta way and Atlanta culture. Like, There's no way in the world I'm going to be a mayor of Atlanta and we're going to have metal detectors at Lennox and Phipps. There's no way in, a, in the world that I'm going to have folks afraid to walk to their vehicle so they have to put a white bag over their purchases because they may, may, they may be robbed going to the car. I don't care if I have to put a police on every block. People should not live like that. Shout out to Greenbrier that has no metal detectors, and it's safer than ever. Thanks. <laughs> I'm over there all the time. I was over there today at Piccadilly. So um, Atlanta doesn't have a lot wrong with it. We're just ha having a tough patch. You know, we got 20% of the people in the city because of the violence who are trying to leave it in the form of Buckhead. And hopefully I'll be able to persuade those folks that this moment regarding crime and violence was a moment in time, not a permanent condition. I, we, think, you know? I, think, I think, too, from what you're saying, that, especially from my, my standpoint, and I think this standpoint is, is a big, um, big thing to put eyes on. I think it's a lack of leadership in the communities, meaning from the street standpoints, mm -hmm. meaning the quote unquote big homies, the unks, the big yeah. dogs. I think it's I think they have to stand up more. And I think they don't stand up more because they don't have nobody to back them. They don't have being real is not popular mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. Especially when you don't have nobody to stand with you. So and every time you do something, it's like, well, I'll speak against this, and everybody like, oh, you do this. So now it's harder for you to do things. But I think that with the support system we have now, working with you, working with everybody that we're dealing with, um, with my guy, um, Scotty, um, with the um, uh, Change Creators, yes. what he's doing for the community and talking for the people. I think building this up, we finally can build an infrastructure that everybody, no matter who you are, can be a part of and have a voice and understand it and your voice be heard exactly on what right. we got going on. What I want to do is I want to show that how much that you are involved into the city yes. when it comes to what go on in here. And I want to talk about a 2017 incident with you. Sure. And I want to ask you to pick your brain. Atlanta go crazy. Yeah. We shut the whole expressway down. Yeah. Ain't no cars. Ain't nobody coming. Police is standoff. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody doing. Ain't nobody moving. It's going to be what it be. Yeah. Seen Reeves pulls up in his car and jumps out. Tell everybody back up, and he walks down here to these people to talk to these people. That's right. And at the end of the day, Kasim gets these people to get off the expressway. That's right. I want to ask, what was in your mental to even have the courage to even go do that? Because the reason I'm saying that, because that's nobody does stuff like that, to, to approach hundreds of angry people. And to get them to calm down, it takes a special person. So I just want to get in your mind and feel like figure out what was going on at the time and how you got that done. First of all, I was sitting in what's called the Joint Operations Command Center, the job. And I was watching it all on television. And it reminded me of Reginald Denny and Rodney King. So there was a, uh, there was a gentleman who was in a truck, and they were rocking that guy's truck, and they were trying to turn it over. And you all know crowds and height. You could see the closer they got to turning over that truck, 
the more excited everybody was getting, right? And I was watching it. And I said that when they turn over that truck, they're not going to stop. They're going to go turn over something else. And so I asked my security to get me and just get me close. And if you love your people, you love your people. I never was concerned about anything happening to me. I walked up to the truck. I told the people to get off the truck. I had the man released. So that truck driver got home to his family. And then regarding the expressway, man, I think about your mother and my mother. My mom is 79 years old. She still drives. So if you can imagine she's coming from my house seeing my daughter going back to her place in Midtown, she's just a 79-year-old lady driving down the freeway. So if there's a situation where humans are in the freeway, she's going to hit the brakes. and God knows what happens. So I think about your mom. I think about my mom. They're not in a protest. Mm -hmm. I also know Ambassador Andrew Young very well. And I know that when Dr. King and Ambassador Young protested, they worked on it and planned it meticulously to protect from accidental loss of life. Mm -hmm. And so that's really... Really, how I feel. I mean, one night I was home in bed, sleep. There were 500 to 1,000 people who were in front of the governor's mansion on West Paces Ferry. Most of them were students from the Atlanta University Center. They were going to storm the governor's mansion. And I got a call from a friend of mine who's close to the governor who said that Georgia State Patrol is not APD. Mm -hmm. So if these people storm the governor's mansion, they're not going to be allowed to do that. Well, I got up, I put on some clothes, I went and I got in the truck, and I met with young person after young person after young person, just informing them that you're about to ruin your life. So you're in Morehouse right now, or Spelman, or Georgia Tech, all these schools, right? When you jump that fence, that's a felony. Mm -hmm. And I don't control it. The state controls it. So you're going to have a felony trespassing charge and, I and can't other help charges you. that I can't do anything about. So you better call your mama and your daddy who sacrificed everything for you to be down here at Spelman. And that's a communicator. And so just call them and let talk, let's, let's talk to them. <laughs> because I want them to know that you're planning to run across the street and jump a fence, and you're definitely going to be arrested. And unlike with me, I already shot on a signature bond. So you won't even get a case. But once you have a state case, every time you do something, it comes up. It's going to come up. And I'm just here to persuade you to make a different decision. I'm not yelling at you. I'm not being discourteous. Mm -hmm. But as a person who's a lawyer and that did pretty well in life, when you jump that fence, you That's better mean it. Be. Exactly. exactly. And so those are the six situations where I think you show real love. I got cussed out. I got called names. But I tell you what, nobody got arrested. Mm -hmm. So nobody got cases. I'm going to ask you this, because, you know, the streets and a lot of my listeners, they like big dog talk. They like the, yeah. the glitz and the glamour yeah, stuff, no right? Yeah, so internet too. So they talk about the big dog talk. Yeah. Obama flying through. You call him and say, stop by, I want to talk to you. <laughs> and he stops by for you to go talk to him. <laughs> Tell us about that. Now, President, <laughs> now, President Obama, you know, when President Obama would come to Atlanta, he, when he would come down the steps, he would say, there's no place like Atlanta. I feel relaxed. The vice president, when she, in all of her campaigns, when she would get to Atlanta, she would say there's no place like Atlanta. So the president was actually concerned about the Ebola crisis. And so when he was coming to the CDC, I always met Air Force One. And if you want to talk about big dog talk, the big dog talk is being responsible for the president's security while he's on the ground. And so when the president lands in your city, you are responsible for supporting all of the operation that keeps him safe. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, Parlay, there's no feeling in the world when you are responsible for supporting the safety of President Barack Obama than when you got that call and said, they say the president's wheels up. That's great. Because having the first black president in your city where you're literally blocking every driveway, mm -hmm. every street. You have multiple directions that uh, he can move through. It just was, you know, it was the honor of my life. And so anytime he landed at Hartsfield-Jackson, 
When you look at that step, I'm in the number one position. Oh, that's big, so though. he would come downstairs, and there's a photo. And we actually shared it. But the photo is like one of my favorite photos in the world. Um, the president wanted to talk to me about a matter privately. And so we stepped out of line, but we were under the nose of Air Force One. Oh, that's great. So if you can just imagine two black men, like we literally are <laughs> under the nose of Air Force One. One, having to pull aside to talk about something that I can't share uh, on uh, on the podcast. But it was a very special moment. In, that big dog talk. Hey, you man. you pulled a bummer to. Yeah. Hey man, pull it to the <laughs> side, man. Let me. Hey, let me step over. Yeah. I'll let you, man. Hey, y'all, hold up. I'm finna go holler at the scene real quick. Real big hey, dog, big dog, dog talk, talk, man. Real big dog talk is what this mayor's ball is gonna look like. When we win this election, in oh there. no, that's that's gonna be the big in the city. I'm putting suit. Yeah. I don't wear suits, but I'm I'm wear yeah, suit. No, you gonna wear one that night. I'm I'm, I'm telling you, I'm coming. Yeah. I'm wearing one. That's big dog. Talk. Two more things before we get up out of yes. here. Yes. All right. For one, I speak to a lot of people, and I want you to touch on the people who think that you're ag- arrogant. Yes. All right. And I feel a sense of that because I know when you have a level of I know what I know how to do, and I know what I know what I'm talking about. To people who not fully confident, and I don't, I call them, I call us alpha males. Yeah. They, they, they tend to seem, we tend to seem to them as like that we're um, arrogant. So, what do you say for them? You know what I say is that I think I'm a different person at 52 than at 40. And I would just, I would remind folks that when I got elected mayor, I was 40 years old. I was the second youngest mayor in the history of the city, and the city was in absolute crisis. So if you remember when President Obama was president, that was the Great Recession, mm-hmm. record unemployment, record foreclosures, the Great Recession. And so I think that I had to be strong and I had to be decisive. And I think that because I had to be strong and I had to be decisive and I did not have a lot of time, that it translated as being arrogant because – I had to make calls, and I didn't have room to allow big collaborative conversations, which may take more time. Mm-hmm. It's one of the reasons why I'm having so much fun running for mayor this time, because I'm a different man at 52, and I think if people were to meet me now, they would not feel the same. Um, that's not my sense, and that's not where I am mentally. And I think you're in the studio with me. You can feel my energy. Like I've been mayor before. And so I'm really running for mayor. I had not planned on running for mayor, and I'm running for mayor to keep our city together. So I think I'm a better man primarily because of my daughter and primarily because of the natural process of maturing. Mm -hmm. And so I think people would encounter that feeling less. But maybe, you know, people perceive... uh, arrogance as they perceive it, but not a lot of people have been mayor of what I think is the most important city in America for black people at a time of crisis. I agree. And the fact of the matter is, is when I took over, there was a crime spike. The city was broke. And when I left, the city had 200 million in cash. I never raised property taxes. I never raised water rates. It had double A plus credit from Standard and Poor's, Moody's and Fitch. Less than 100 people were murdered in Atlanta, seven out of eight years. I hired 900 police officers. And you name something significant that's happened, whether it's the State Farm Arena deal, the Mercedes Benz Stadium transaction that then led to the soccer team, to Pont City Market, to the sale of the old Turner Field property to Georgia State, the entire reimagining of the city. I'm launching an entrepreneurial initiative for women where we took women entrepreneurs and really, you know, were the wind beneath their wings, spending a billion dollars with women entrepreneurs at Hartsfield Jackson Airport. Forty six cents out of every dollar when I was mayor was spent with a black entrepreneur or a person of color. And so when you're trying to accomplish all of those things, you have to call it and you have to make judgments that probably come off to some as arrogant. I don't, but I don't think uh, this next time, once we push back on crime and violence, uh, I'm going to, I think I'm going to have a lot more fun and relax a bit more in the job. And I think people will feel that. Mm-hmm. But it's a terrific question. I, I just appreciate you asking me that in my face. 
Oh no, definitely. Yeah. Hey man, hey one yeah. one thing about me. One hundred. I'm gonna ask yeah. what need to be asked. Yeah. Nah. Because like I say, I represent people and they look for me to have yeah. for leadership skills and yeah. they look for me to ask things that they want to know and what they yeah. need to. Yeah. And everything that you said bring me to my last question. I want to bring this to light for people yes. because it hasn't something that haven't actually happened yet. Yes. Let's talk about the gulch. Yes. And the gulch is for everybody who's watching, this is when what Kasim was talking about up on the state farm. If in the build a hope, let's just talk about it so I won't misinform anybody. On exactly yeah, what's going so on. so if you've ever been to the State Farm Arena, if you look to the left, you see a hole in the ground. So what's going to happen with the Gulch is they're going to build a forty-five foot deck and a five billion dollar project that is made up of retail and residential housing, and it's going to be probably the most impressive development in the history of the city. And it was a deal. Um, that I initiated along with the folks at the Gulch by getting a tax rebate from the state. And it's going to be uh, absolutely incredible. And it's something that every person of color who is an entrepreneur needs to be preparing for and needs to be getting involved in. I'm it's gonna get definitely a happening. And it's going to be amazing. I'm going I'm to give, I'm going to, you modest. And you're yeah. supposed to be you. Yeah. I'm going to put in the street term for, the deal wouldn't happen without Kasim. That's right. I'm just, that's no what question. it is. It's big talk. It's yeah. big dog talk. If it wasn't for Kasim, it wouldn't be happening. So to say that, to bring all that revenue back to the city, to get all that money back flowing so more people and more black entrepreneurs can get it and find ways now, figure out what you need to do, get in, become a part of the rebuild of Atlanta, how it's going to be again. Now I got a real simple message to everybody listening to this podcast. If you own property in Atlanta, don't sell it. Don't sell it. Free game. And if you all can purchase property in Atlanta by now and figure out a way to hold it, and if you got a mama or auntie or cousin and they're about to lose their property, you need to help them keep it and work out an arrangement. Because I am telling you, the wealth that is being created right now is not going to be matched in the next 20 or 30 years. So if I'm fortunate enough to be your mayor in November and reelected, I'm going to walk around with a T-shirt on that says, don't sell. Don't let anybody trick you. Don't let anybody call you about a $7,500 tax lien or a $10,000 tax lien where they call you up and say they'll pay off the tax lien and give you plus $10,000 on it or something like that. I'm going to create an office of anti-displacement for situations just like that. So don't sell. Free game, man. I think I, think I want to say appreciate you for taking the time out. No question. I wouldn't be anywhere else right now. You know what I'm saying? So um, much respect. Oh, definitely, definitely, definitely. My mind's just racing. There's just so much stuff I want to say, but the time we have, think everything we said was touched on a lot of good things. Oh, no, no, I think no. a lot of my people who are who are watching this and who see this. I told P.I. was on the way over here. I told yeah. Pedro I was coming on your yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, nah, she, definitely. She's been on my phone while I'm sitting here. <laughs> nah, definitely, definitely, good man. Good people, faith Which is, and, like I, and another thing where I think – I'm a, I'm a real big person of, I don't believe in coincidences. Yeah. I believe everything happens is supposed to happen. My good friend Mooley's around you. Yeah. My good friend Chris Chris is with you. Yes. My good friend Chris Hicks is with you. And actually, Chris being the um, old feminine development in Atlanta was, was, was the reason I got a lot of my um, um, permits to shoot in Atlanta because I shot a lot of movies in Atlanta on, yeah. the, on the west side, on Simpson Road. And I just want to say thank you. And I did connection, I think. When you become mayor, because we're going to definitely help you. Yes. Um, me and my people and everybody who voice I represent, we're going to do our job, you know what I'm saying, to make us a lot of Well, I got a free game here. for you. Um, you all better get ready to start making TV commercials. It's the next thing. Mm -hmm. So if you all think that the motion picture business was amazing, you wait till we start making commercials in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. The commercial production business is a $50, $50 billion industry. So what's going to happen in the future is they're going to, they're going to do the creative in L.A. and New York, and I'm going to have them shoot the commercial in Atlanta. And I'm going to create an incentive regime to capture that opportunity, and people have no idea what's going to happen. So that's all of the music related to commercial, the filming related to commercials, the actors related to commercials, right? the craft services related to commercials. And so that's what's coming up next. So get ready. We're getting ready to have a bunch of fun, y'all. Oh, definitely, definitely, definitely. Like I say, appreciate you coming out to the apartment. Hey, till next time. We in the apartment with Parlay. Meet me in the apartment.